So we think about passing through things temporal and losing not the things eternal this week. Uh, lines from the collect of the day that we'll be uh, hearing a little later in this service. There are a couple of other things that go with that collect. Part of it is a short one, but it's full. And among the things uh, are, are these statements. Uh, Without God, nothing is strong and nothing is holy. Uh, God will be the ruler and guide who can lead us through the things temporal. And that ruler and guide, in particular, is the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, The ruler, of course, is Jesus Christ, our risen King. Uh, The glory of His Father is all that we need to see to know where the authority lies. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. But the work of the Spirit, as we see it in Romans chapter 8, is astounding. Because last week we saw how it is the Spirit that constitutes this family of God that was referenced tonight, this large family that is where all of us will find our place. Uh, And this isn't speculation, this is not idle, uh, wishful thinking, this is not based on good feelings about the gospel or good feelings about anything else, it's based on fact. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Jesus Christ has given us the promise of his spirit through his, with his Father. We share in that spirit by our baptisms. The creation of the church is the work of the Holy Spirit the sharing across centuries of Christian lives bound together by the work of the Spirit is fact, not wishful thinking. The promise of Christ that we will have a resurrection like His, if we put our faith and trust in His, in Him, is fact, not feeling. Now there's a, there's a difficulty with all of the beauty in this passage tonight. I want to go back to one verse and read it to you because this may be a verse that causes you some stumbling. I know it does for other people, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. It's the verse that is uh, actually verse 28, if you've got your Bibles open at home, of chapter 8. It's translated in this version, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. That is one of three ways that that can be translated. And this way is maybe the weakest because people look at that and say, all things are good and are going to work for my good. And sometimes people are in the middle of terrible times. Think back to the psalm we read tonight. The psalm we read tonight is filled with happiness and promise and peace and prosperity. It is wonderful to hear. It is not true all the time, is it? There are plenty of other psalms that depict a whole different side of life and all kinds of conflict and sadness and weakness that needs to be remedied by the touch of God. And when someone that you know or I know is in deep sadness or deep sorrow or has only observed the world around them and seen the pain and the suffering and the weakness that is there, It is very difficult for them to imagine that St. Paul actually means that everything is working for our good. It's such a difficult verse, particularly translated in this way, that many people will simply close the Bible and say, I can't take that. Let me tell you a story from uh, my family history. I, I come from a very small family. Uh, I had a a much older than me sister, and among the cousins, uh, my mother was an only child, and so there were no cousins that I knew well on her side, but on my dad's side, there were a few. And there was one uh, young male cousin that I grew up with. We'd see each other during the summers at lake time when we were in South Dakota and things like that. I lost touch with him uh, after Uh, I got too old to go to Madison, South Dakota for the summertime at the lake. But uh, he he and I were very good friends, and there were a lot of things that were alike about us. He was in seminary once, uh, but he left. Uh, His name is Michael. Uh, Our son, Michael, is not named after him, but 
Uh, he might well have been. He could have been. Michael was a fine man, Michael, my cousin. Uh, I just received news of his death about, oh, two weeks ago, I guess. Uh, one of his sisters, his only surviving sister, there were only three in that family, or four, uh, his surviving sister called me to tell me about his death. Michael had been in seminary, but it didn't work out. And he left it, and I'm not sure why. And after about 20 years from when I was 25, when, when I was about 50, 55, we met up again at my grandmother's funeral. My grandmother lived to be almost 103. And so older cousins all came back together for that burial. And while we were there, Michael and I and his one younger brother uh, sat down and began to solve all of the problems of the world with a bottle of particularly good scotch. Uh, my grandmother would not have approved. She was a, she was a dedicated bourbon drinker. <laughs> but as we talked through and so on, it became very clear to me that the boy that I remembered who was ready for ordination as a priest had grown into an adult who had no use for a life in the Christian church. He had spent uh, the last 20 years or so happily married. Uh, he married a woman, a French woman, a broadcaster, who, that he saw her uh, doing the weather on a Paris TV channel and decided that he was going to marry her. And he did. They had several children. He was a novelist. He wrote five novels published by Alfred Knopf. He, he was big time in his day. He became well known internationally in computer systems for banks and ended his days as a well known international consultant. And uh, his son, his only son, has also grown up as a business consultant and he advises Middle Eastern and African oil companies on production methods and so on. You can see this is a, a, a well-equipped family in terms of intellect. But back 25 years ago when Michael and I were talking, he asked me, he said, how can you, how can you work in the church week after week? How can you go to people and preach the love of God when there is so much suffering and sadness in the world? And the conversation, uh, with the help of the Scotch, uh, I should have forgotten it, but I remembered Romans 8. And I relied on the later part of this message, the later part of this gospel tonight, where Jesus, uh, where Paul describes uh, that God did not spare his own son, but allowed him to enter into the suffering of this world so it could be redeemed. And we talked about that for 15 or 20 minutes, maybe an hour. And finally he said, you know, if I ever did come back to the life of the church, if I ever did return to the church, it would be because of something like that. Well, Michael had both of his children baptized and he raised them in Catholic schools in France and I don't know whether he ever went back to church or not. But I want to refer back to something I said in my sermon on Sunday about small seeds. Because my prayer, now that Michael is no longer in this life, is that God is showing him exactly how hard it is to be separated from the love of God. And I am confident that God is working that out with Michael now. The reason I'm telling you that story is so that you do not blunder into a terrible situation sometime when you are dealing with a friend who is in grief or sadness or who has observed some terrible injustice and you try to say to them, well, God makes all things work together for good. Please do not say that to them in the midst of such a time they are likely to walk away from you unhappy. Remember that when I had that conversation with my cousin, we were aided by a large amount of scotch. 
But I do want you to take this lesson to heart out of Romans tonight, that nothing separates us from the love of Christ. Nothing separates us from the love of Christ. The bond with the Holy Spirit is permanent and lasting. And Jesus involves himself, his Father involves himself, the Spirit involves himself with us in this trouble. Other ways that that verse gets translated are easier. They will say things like, we know that God works in all things for good. God does not cause or send the suffering of this world. God is in the business of redeeming that suffering. But you need to learn this lesson now for yourself and for others so that when the most severe of testing comes, you don't fall away in despair and lose in passing through these things temporal, the vision of what God is actually giving us for all eternity. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And just a little bit earlier in chapter 8, in last week's reading, Paul says, I consider that the suffering of this present time is nothing compared to what will be revealed. God bless us all as we suffer and in our weakness look for and rely upon the Spirit who prays for us in ways that we can never understand or know, but lets God involve himself and assist us in everything. Amen.